I love that little clip. It's amazing how clips like that become such a fabric of the culture in which you're living. When I look at that clip, I think to myself, what, what is it that motivates Lucy to always move the ball? Or I think of Charlie Brown and what makes him think that this time it's gonna be any different? You know, poor Charlie Brown, you know, he's doing the same thing, expecting a different result. You ever feel like that? Maybe you're a little tired of the Lucy's of this world always moving the ball. And you wonder, what can we do to stop this fruitless exercise? Well, there's an answer. The answer comes at a price. And the question is whether we're willing to pay that price. That answer is going to be found for us in 1 Peter as we begin to look again at the passage of Scripture that's found for us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. Um, but before we get there, I just want to talk to you about personal transformation. In fact, when we began our study in the book of 1 Peter, Let's just take a look back for a moment and recognize that Peter begins by making a statement back in verse 2 that says that we have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by His blood. So grace and peace be yours in abundance. This choosing, this sanctifying work of the Spirit so that we might be more and more obedient to this call of God on our life. This is all part of this new identity that we have received as children of God. That's why now when we look at verse 11 of chapter 2, we read this. It says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul and live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. You know, as you look at that text, I want you to notice two words that should just jump off the page at you. One of them is the word abstain, and the other is the word live. You see, as we're being called to this personal spiritual transformation, those are two words that begin to define what that personal transformation really looks like. Notice here it says to abstain, right, from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. This is very much like the rid yourselves of every malice, envy, slander, like it said in chapter 2, verse 1. Sinful desires here wage war against your soul. What does that really mean when you think about it? You notice that it speaks about this internal conflict. It's your soul. And it says that if we that the, these sinful desires have a way of creating so much internal conflict within us that there's no rest, there's no peace. In fact, when you live in this, in this fashion by not abstaining from those sinful desires, that war that you feel within, it's just contrary to God's way of living. And you see it in the way in which you feel, in the perspective you have as you look out on the world. Not too long ago, we had an opportunity to look at those six characteristics that Peter mentioned should be a part of every child of God. A prepared mind, contrast to the mind that's unprepared for action, self-controlled over against being unrestrained, living life with the end in mind instead of living life for the moment, pursuing holiness, or do I pursue my own ambitions? Am I seeking first the kingdom of God, or am I seeking to establish my own kingdom? Am I seeking to love one another deeply from the heart, or do I find myself becoming more and more indifferent to the people around me? See, all of this has to deal with one of the reasons why in this personal transformation, we're being told to abstain from these sinful desires because it creates such internal conflict, especially for the child of God who's seeking to live in a different way. 
But now notice here it says we are to live such good lives, right, among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So in contrast to abstaining from sinful desire, we're being told to press on before this unbelieving world, even though they may accuse you of doing wrong. You know, I, I thought about that. I saw this idea of living. It's not like all of a sudden everything is going to be perfect. In fact, very often living such a good life may, in fact, you know, raise the ire of those around us. I mean, the text is saying here that you live, live such a good life among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong. So there is a sense of accusation that comes from even trying to live this godly life. And, and, and we're told that they may accuse us, but what is the reason for that? You ever notice that people, they don't always do the right thing. In fact, very often, and especially in the days in which we're living, people often draw the wrong conclusions. They hear some words, and suddenly those words, they act as triggers. They see something, it triggers. I mean, it's such an a overused word in the day in which we're living, right? But it is true. Very often we can look at the same thing and people draw different, different conclusions based on their own personal experiences. And if part of those experiences have created hurt and damage, then you can see how very often the response is going to be some things that are just exponentially different than someone else. But this sense of accusation goes beyond just drawing wrong conclusions. Sometimes you can see that in the way in which people just look at your desire to live a holy life. How often have you maybe personally experienced that here you are trying to do the right thing, trying to live uh, according to the standards by, by which God is placing before us, and what you get back is people thinking, oh, you think you're just better than me. When that's the furthest thing from your mind, you're just trying to pursue God in a way that shows yourself to be mindful of this call to holiness. Or people will say to you, oh, you're too heavenly minded. You know, you're, you're always thinking about everything out there that you're just too narrow minded for the rest of us. But God is only asking us to receive this gift in Jesus. And um, God is asking us now to receive this grace and to live a life that shows that we are thankful. And that thankfulness is demonstrated in the way in which we try to adhere to these boundaries that God has set up for us. He says, by this, all men will know that you love me, right? That, that, that we have love for one another, but also that we are listening and putting into practice God's word. And um, for the world at large, they're all so busy trying to earn their way into whatever they think heaven might be. But you and I both understand that um, we don't earn our way in. It is a gift. And all we do is seek to live a life in response to that. And how easily that's misunderstood. Or how about when people say to you, you just don't know how to enjoy life. You need to loosen up. I often think now that I've lived a number of years, where's the enjoyment when these very habits cause us shame? Or when decisions that we've made cost us dearly? Yeah, you see, there, there, is, um, there is no enjoyment when you look down the road and realize it was just fool, foolishness. So we ought to live such good lives that even in the midst of people accusing us, they're going to see something of our good deed and hopefully lead them to a place where they glorify God on the day that he visits us. So, so far, we've been talking about this personal transformation that's taking place, right? This personal transformation that is seen in two things. One, abstaining from all these sinful desires that wage war against our soul. Because you can't live double-minded. You're going to be unstable in everything that you do. If I'm going to commit my life to Jesus, 
then it means that I am going to be putting off this old man here, this old self. And as my mind is being renewed, it says I'm going to put on this new self. And so this this personal transformation has everything to do with living this godly life and abstaining from from, um, these sinful desires. And so as I set my mind and I set my heart towards Jesus and I walk in that direction, you watch how your life slowly is walking away from the very things that have led to your undoing. But notice in this text, it goes on now a little bit further. And it says, live such godly lives that they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So there's something about your good deeds that are now being put on public display. Our personal transformation is on public display. And you know why? Because it's hoping now that it's going to give God glory. That it, we're hoping that they're going to see our good deeds and glorify God. Because here's the point. Jesus is coming back. That stone that was rejected, the stone that has been a stumbling block for many, that stone is the chief cornerstone, and he's coming back. This living stone rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him is going to return, and he will return to his spiritual house, the church of God that's comprised of living stones. As Paul would write to the Ephesians, who also, by the way, lived in Asia Minor, he reminds them that we are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. We looked at that last week, didn't we? The collective impact that living stones have on the world in which they live. So it's not just about my personal transformation, but it's about my personal transformation that is now on public display. People are going to see those good deeds and Hopefully, they're going to be moved to glorify God when he comes again. So do you get it? The good deeds is not just for you just to be a good person. Your good deeds are leading people to an understanding of who God is and what it means to be in relationship with him. That's why it's so important that we do the right things. Your good deeds are on public display. These good deeds They are the fruit that's produced when we desire him, when we crave him. These good deeds are signs that we have been transformed by our relationship with Jesus. These good deeds are meant for all the world to see because the good deeds are born out of our personal transformation. This transformation takes place when we embrace the concepts of not only abstaining from sinful desire, but living godly lives. Our personal transformation demonstrates our allegiance to the gospel, this good news that was preached to us, to the living and enduring word of the Lord that stands forever, an allegiance to the pure spiritual milk that will help us to grow up in our salvation. You see, our personal transformation is now put on public display. And after all, Were we not given this new identity? Verses 9 and 10 of chapter 2, it says, Remember, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Can you stop there for a moment? Do you realize what this is saying? That this personal transformation is so that we now have a platform to declare the praises of him who called us out of his darkness into his marvelous light. Because once we were not a people of God, and now we are. Once we have not been shown mercy, now we have received mercy. Well, what follows in the letter of 1 Peter is the highlighting now of social relationships. You see, in this week's Seize the Day, I'm going to address the various social relationships highlighted in the text. But it's a long text, 
and time today doesn't permit her to do that. But during the week, during our seize the day, we're going to take a look at these various relationships. But today, I would like to take a text and highlight with the first social relationship that's mentioned. And it's going to be an interesting one. I just pray that God would grant us all ears to hear. Because what we find in this text is a timely example. In the following text, there could not be a more timely illustration of how our personal spiritual transformation is called to be put on public display. It is worth highlighting that Peter writes again to a scattered, estranged group of believers, right? They're all living in very tumultuous times under this reign of Nero, who is the emperor of the Roman Empire. Nero's day was marked by excess, violence, factions, political, and moral and spiritual bankruptcy. Nero would die in his early 30s. Listen, no doubt the Apostle Paul, which was a contemporary to Peter, also considered these excesses when he wrote his letter to the Romans. Notice how he captures the, uh, the, cur the current climate of the day and of the heart of man. Speaking of humanity, he says, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. See, because what flows out of the mind now is going to be seen in our actions. And notice here in verse 29, he says, they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They're gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. And although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, notice what it says, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. These are strong words. These are strong words that are used to depict the society that obviously does not crave the pure spiritual milk of God's word. As I read those words, you probably had a flood of examples that come to mind. And each one of those examples could be enough to leave us feeling so dejected and despondent. But Peter, I want you to notice, is undaunted. Peter is going to take this gospel, the good news of Jesus, and he's going to place it boldly in the public square because he is confident that the good news of Jesus is more than able to stand firm in any hostile environment. Peter knows firsthand that when a person builds his life upon the foundation of God's word, a word that's filled with great and precious promises, that then and only then will we experience a divine power that enables us to participate in God's divine nature and escape the corruption that's in the world caused by evil desires. See, this new birth that we receive from God, which is at the very heart of our personal transformation, this new birth empowers us to abstain from evil desire and to live good lives that reflect God's ways. Make no mistake, Peter's words, the very revelation of God's power has changed the world. Peter's words strengthened many in his day to stand in opposition to the hate and rancor in their day and in subsequent generations. Peter's words were the very antidote to the sickness that was born from our sinful desires. And Peter's words have the power to do the same today. Yet the power to change the world comes at a great cost, a cost that many in the world think is way too high and quite frankly, some just think is absurd. 
But we live in times when many, they've placed their hopes on the dreams of a few. We live in a time when, again, political power is presented as the solution to the evil that intimidates this world. We live in times when too many people believe that the sheer volume of their opinions is sufficient to bring about the healing of the heart, the trouble in one's soul. These grand experiments have been tried before. There remains a tug of war where each side claims its share of victories, but little happens that cures the human condition. Come on, you know what I'm saying. Our country is reeling from recent political events. We find ourselves now where opinions are used as weapons seeking to annihilate one's opponents. We cast shade on everything. So it is little surprise that the days seem dark. So the battle lines have been drawn and the pressure mounts to pick a side. Shots have been fired, literally. And the casualties are piling up. Don't you feel it? As a nation, we're weary. We feel the darkness around us. We have to fight the temptation to despair. So now I want you to listen carefully to Peter's words, words that changed lives, changed homes, changed communities, changed the world. And I know the cost is high, and I know that it's going to feel absurd, but we are assured that victory is won in this matter. Are you ready to listen? Look what it says in verse 13 as Peter begins to speak of our, of our relationship to the authorities around us. He says this, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as a supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. You know, the word there for submission is a word that speaks of aligning ourselves behind the other. In our text here, we are called to submit, to align ourselves, not with the governing authorities because we agree with their policies. We're called to submit not because we fear retribution. We're not called to submit because of who the king or the governors are. In fact, if you really think about it, Peter is writing to a people whose king and governors Weren't they the very ones who conspired against Jesus and had him crucified on a tree? Are they not Herod who slaughtered the innocent children? Was it not Pilate who had Jesus scourged? And as far as the king and emperor, is it not Nero who plotted against Christ's followers, feeding them to the lions in games in, a, in, a, in the Colosseum? No, we must never forget that God is going to hold all people accountable. God will exercise judgment. We are told in Romans 12, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And he says, don't take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. And why is that? Because only God can exercise righteous judgment. So we're being called then to, a, to submit to less than the ideal. And why? Because our submission is for the Lord's sake. And why do I say that? Well, look again at verse 15. It says, for it is God's will 
that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. You see, this personal transformation that has been taking place inside of us is now put on public display, and God wants everyone to see your good deed, and he says it will silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. We're called to mimic the very character of the living stone. We are called upon to live as God's servants, to show respect to everyone, to love the brotherhood, to worship God, meaning listen to him. And we're called to honor the king. Really? To honor Nero? And why? Because our allegiance is to God first. Our agenda is to, his agenda is to be ours. Nothing is supposed to stand in the way of us exercising ourselves to do what Jesus said one day will prove to be evidence for the judgment between the sheep and the goats. Hold on a moment. What I'm really trying to say to you here is that God's way of changing the world isn't by some political platform and some laws of reform. God says the way we're going to change the world is when we change the heart of man. And the only way they're going to see that is when they see it displayed in the very followers who said they love Jesus. Isn't that what Jesus said to us? Matthew 25, beginning at verse 34, this great passage. Notice what it says. Jesus tells them that one day the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance. Remember, we have been given a, an inheritance undefiled, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God. This living hope that, that sustains us and motivates us to, to live this life in a fashion that finds us abstaining from the evil and doing the good. Now Jesus says, come, all of you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance this kingdom prepared for you since the creations of the world. And then notice what he says, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Okay. Okay. Let's hit the pause button here for a moment. Do you realize on this day that we will stand before Jesus? The scales of justice are going to be weighed dependent on the the way in which we lived such godly lives before others that it caught the attention of the King of kings and Lord of lords. He has called us then, he says, when you saw me hungry, when you saw me thirsty, when you saw me naked, when you saw me sick or in prison, when I was a stranger, all of those things that, by the way, go way beyond just coming together in public worship, those are the ways in which the people of God are now acting out in the world in which they live, a world that is a mixed bag of all kinds of tension, bad fruit, good fruit, weeds as well as stalks of wheat, right? All of those things coming together in a mixed bag in a world. And God says, I want them to see that you're different. You're called to live this way. And by the way, all of those things, they're surprised. They say, Lord, when did we see you? And do you notice his response? His response was, whenever you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. In other words, the way we treat neighbor is indicative of the way in which we are treating God. If you're not treating your neighbor in a respectful way, in an honoring way, then you can't possibly glorify God. First John says it plainly. He says, how can you say you love God whom you have not seen if you don't love your brother whom you have seen? 
all of this conversation and vitriol that takes place back and forth, if we just did those texts, if we just put those things into practice, would we not be mindful of the disenfranchised, those who are hurting, those who are being marginalized? Would we not personally then take responsibility for the way in which we are called to act in this world? That whatever personal transformation is taking place in me is now put on public display so that that Christian is one who comes alongside and they know that that is an individual who's here to help, who's going to bear one another's burdens. It's not legislation. I'm not putting my, 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 uh, my hope in kings and princes. I put my hope in the living God, and the living God is telling me that the only way for me to react to the governing authorities is to submit to them, but to also live my life as a free man before God, to make sure that I honor God, that I worship him, that I love the brotherhood, that I do all I can to respect one another. I dare say, just do a cursory look at what's taking place in the war on social media Brother against brother? That's honoring to God? No. You know what's the reverse of that? In Matthew 20, uh, 25, it says the same thing to those. He says, you now, he says, are, are in danger of eternal judgment because when I was hungry, you did not feed me. You did not give me something to drink. You did not welcome me in your homes. You did not you know, um, clothe me or visit me or take care of me when I was sick. And their response is the same exact question of the others. They said, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, naked, sick, imprisoned? And Jesus says, whenever you did not do it to the least of these, you didn't do it to me. In other words, God saying, you don't have to, <laughs> what's not necessary is for you to be talking up a big game about how I am so mindful of, the, of those less fortunate. All that is talk. God wants to know what are you doing in your life individually as a result of your own personal spiritual transformation to engage the world in a public fashion that shows that you are there for those who are hurting, to those who are disenfranchised. It's enough to talk and talk and talk and come so boldly out in, 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 a, in a social media way. It's another thing to live your life in a way that you share what you have, that you invite people in, that you show them something of the good news of Jesus, because it is the one thing that's going to take people from this life and bring them into the world to come. Let me end this way. There are three things that I want you to walk away with today from our passage. We are called to fight evil. Evil is our spiritual enemy. We have to fight against these sinful desires that wage war within our very souls and of which are also damaging the world in which we live. We're called to fight evil, not one another. Isn't that what it says? Here's another uh, parallel passage. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. See, it's not against people. It's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You see, if a person received a change of heart, that would place them on a path then, having been washed now by the blood of Jesus that removes sin. Now I am abstaining from those sinful desires and I am living this godly life. That same person who may have been, you know, a, um, a, a, a thorn in your flesh, that, that person who was an instrument of unrighteousness, now by the very mercy of God, by the grace of God in their life, they are transformed. They are given a new birth. And it's seen now in the way in which they live their lives publicly. You and I have an opportunity to see that happen in lives of people all around us. 
Jesus said, let them see your good deeds so that they may glorify your Father who is in heaven. You and I become this catalyst for spiritual growth in other people if they just see you living the way Jesus has called us to. But not only that, we're not only called to this fight, we're called to dress for the fight. And how you dress for that fight is with the garments of God's armor. Again, it goes on to say in Ephesians, therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, and it will, and it does, you may be able to stand your ground and after everything, after you have done everything, to stand. So how is that? Notice here, you have to stand firm, what? With the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with a breastplate of righteousness in place, doing the right things, living the godly life, with your feet fitted with the readiness of the, uh, that comes from the gospel of peace. Why? Because your mind has now been prepared for action. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can dis- extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one because faith in God is the confidence that I have that all that he promises will come true. Faces the assurance of things not seen, the conviction of things hoped for. I put on this helmet of salvation and I pick up the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. That is the only weapon that I am given. And I am to pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. I am called to fight evil, not people. I am called to dress for the fight in a way that demonstrates my allegiance to God and to his gospel. But I am also called to fight with spiritual weapons. Second Corinthians says this, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. You catch that? I'm not engaged in this war the same way the world is. They're conniving. They, they, uh, they, it's, it's double speak. It's half truths. It's, it's, it's putting down your opponents. It's, it's um, reaching for the lowest common denominators at times. God hasn't called me to that. Notice what he says, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That is the war that we are engaged in, to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Jesus. So my friends, when he says here that we are to submit to every authority because we are mindful of God, that it is his will that we live such godly lives that they may see our good deeds and silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. I know that's not popular in the days in which we're living. It doesn't seem like it's being, you know, much of an activist. It doesn't seem like we have this moral indignation But stop for a moment and think about all the hyperbole that is being cast out there. All the talk, all the perspiration. And what's what's changing? Except it's making people harder and less loving, more separated. I'm called to love my enemy. God says the cost for changing the world is high. It requires you and I to lock arms with the Spirit of God and go out and live out your personal transformation in a public display. And God's saying, when you do, there will be some who reject, there will be some who sneer, but there will be boatloads of people who will take notice and they'll want what you have because they see in you the fruit of the spirit of love and joy and peace and patience and every good thing that comes from our Father in heaven. Don't get sucked into this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We are the church of the living God. We are those living stones that one day is going to be complete giving refuge to the world at large. 
Nothing less is going to satisfy the needs of a broken world and a damaged heart. I love Jesus. I love what he does in his people. I love that he counts no one out, but that his grace is sufficient to take the worst of sinners and change them into a child of God. That motivates me every day. And when I look at a world that is so dark, I think that the light has promised to cast off the darkness because it will never overcome it. Be the light. The cost, yeah, it's high, but the victory is assured. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for these words penned at a time of such great tumult in the life of those living under this Roman occupation. People were enslaved. Violence, the political hypocrisy and maneuvering of the Caesars is legendary. It caused so much hardship for generations of people. And sadly, Lord, it's no different than the days in which we live today. All around the world, there are marks, Lord, again, of tyrants and despots, of oppressive ways that are just seeking to blow out the very light that resides within us. But greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. We remind ourselves again that we are able to stand against the fiery arrows of the evil one because we are standing firm in the Lord and in his might. It's not our fight, it's yours. But we have aligned ourselves to you we have submitted ourselves to your will and purpose, and you will lead us into victory. I pray, Lord, for that spiritual transformation to take place in the lives of those who maybe at present want nothing to do with you. But if they were to touch, if they were to be touched by the grace of God, they would be different. And I pray for that. I pray for their spiritual transformation, and I pray, Lord, that you would allow me and all of us who name the name of Jesus to live such good lives that they may see our good deeds, and we will silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Fill us, Lord. Move us. Empower us so that we may accomplish all the good that you have. And I pray this in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior, King of kings, ruler over every authority, power, and dominion. It's Jesus, the living stone. It's his name that we pray. Amen.